talk about cognitive load, let's think for a moment of the brain like it's a computer. The community is actually divided on whether or not the brain actually operates this way, but for the purposes of this explanation, it's a useful metaphor. So your brain has a certain number of resources available to it, the same way your computer has a certain number of processor resources available to it. Each thing that the brain is working on takes up some of those resources. Let's say you're at home in a quiet area working on a calculus problem that requires 60% of your cognitive resources. In that setting, you have plenty of resources to solve that problem. However, then you go to take a calculus test. Now you have some stress in there. Now you're stressing about the impact this test is going to have on your grade. You're stressing about how well other people seem to think they're doing on it, whether or not other people seem to be struggling while you struggle. This is taking up a lot of your cognitive resources. Here we see the stress taking up 50% of the cognitive resources you have. Now you don't have sufficient resources to complete the problem successfully. I hypothesize that's why test-taking anxiety can have such a negative effect. It takes resources away from actually working on the test. You can apply these same principles to the presence of distractions, anxiety disorders, and more. Cognitive load has two major applications to our work in designing interfaces. One, we want to reduce the cognitive load posed by the interface so that the user can focus on the task. Second, we want to understand the context of what else is going on while users are using our interface. We need to understand what else is competing for the cognitive resources users need to use our interface. If we're designing a GPS or a navigation system, for example, we want to be aware that the user will have relatively few cognitive resources because they're focusing on so many things at once.